So my, my message to patients is that as important as these larger external environmental issues are, that they can perhaps have the biggest effect on the external environment by beginning to focus on their internal environment. And the way that you resolve your internal environmental imbalances is through diet, sleep, and exercise. And that the type of diet that's going to be most effective at producing a health-promoting internal environment is a whole plant food diet that also eliminates the addition of salt, oil, and sugar. That's it. Well, I guess I'm finishing up. And I think I'm going to finish up by telling you a little story. So this story happened about 40 years ago when I was in university. And I was visiting my parents. And my dad, uh, he loved to tease me about my interest in nutrition. And I remember him uh, walking by. I was, sitting, I was actually standing in the kitchen making lunch. And he walked by me and he stuck his belly out as far as he could. And he had two cigarettes hanging out of his mouth and a bag of chips in one arm, bag of licorice, all sorts under his armpit, and a two-liter bottle of Coke in the other hand. And he looked at me and he just had this big cheeky grin on his face. And uh, I just, of course, gave him the look of disgust. And, and a couple of hours later, I, I went and talked to him and I said, I don't, I don't understand why you're doing this. Um, you know, we, we want you to stick around. <laughs> we want you to to be here for the long haul. And uh, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I, I'd sooner live 50 years doing all the things I love to do uh, than live 75 having to uh, give up my freedom to do what I love. And he said, you know, I could get hit by a truck tomorrow. And I looked at him and I said, I know, Dad, but it doesn't mean you have to walk out in front of one. And the reality is that probably about 80% or more of the chronic diseases that are killing most of us are entirely preventable. It is our choice. And I think the thing that prevents people from making the right choice is, is that a, a huge need to belong to their tribe. And as we see mainstream shift, it will get easier and easier for people, and we, knew, we need to do everything we can to make it easier. And, and the reality is, when we make a choice uh, for our health, there are consequences beyond ourselves. And the consequences were very eloquently laid out by the other speakers. The consequences are, we preserve this planet for future generations. And we remove, to a large extent, the suffering of the 70 billion animals that are slaughtered on this planet every year for our food. <laughs> to, to me, it makes no sense that we, can, we, that we cause pain, suffering, and death to other living beings when it is not only unnecessary. We are destroying our planet in the process. We have a choice, and we need to make the right one for ourselves and for every other being that is on this planet. I'm going to ask the question you're all thinking to ask. Brenda, what happened to your dad? <laughs> uh, well, it, it is quite a story. And, and you know, my dad didn't make the kind of changes I wish he would have made. Um, but he was told, he, he actually about uh, two, three years after this interaction, he had a stroke and was taken to the hospital. His blood pressure was 220 over 120. His blood sugar was over 500 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, he had to have grafts put below his heart into his legs. And he was told if he didn't stop smoking, he'd live three months. And if he did, he might live three years. And I can still remember sitting on his hospital bed and uh, right after the doctor told him, and the tears were coming down, and he looked at me and he said, I don't want to die. I, I, I want to dance with 
the love of my life at our 50th wedding anniversary. I want to see my grandchildren grow up. And it was at that point that my dad, I think, understood that without health, there is no freedom at all. And, and so my dad quit smoking, and he started eating oatmeal and blueberries and flax seeds instead of bacon and eggs for breakfast. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say that, that he stuck around for probably 26 more years, way longer than anyone ever um, thought he would, and for that I am grateful. Uh, he died in 2011, and I miss him every day. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for asking. <clears throat> I, uh, been <clears throat> listening to the others, and I thought that the way I'd like to make a few comments about why it is that a general surgeon gets interested in nutrition. And in the late 1970s and early 80s, when I was chairman of our breast cancer task force, I got quite disillusioned with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. <clears throat> and that led me to a bit of a global research, and it was really quite striking to find that there were other cultures where indeed breast cancer rates were 30 and 40 times less frequent than the United States. And if you looked at the women in rural Japan in post-World War II, uh, breast cancer was very infrequently identified. And yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States by the second and third generation, still pure Japanese American, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. Perhaps even more compelling was uh, looking at Japan. In 1958, in the entire nation of Japan, how many autopsy proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? Well, 18. That was the most mind boggling public health figure I think I've ever encountered. By 1978, they were up to 137, which still pales in comparison to the 28,000 who will die this year in this country from prostate cancer. But it was long in this global research, I be began to notice that I was encountering multiple cultures where cardiovascular disease was almost virtually non-existent. And it suddenly dawned on me that, you know, that's the leading killer of women and men in Western civilization. And really, it would be probably much more bang for the buck if we could do research on cardiovascular disease and show indeed that we could not only halt it but reverse it. But the dream was that if people could be taught to eat to save their heart, they would at the same time be likely diminishing the likelihood of having the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and pancreatic. But here's where the rubber hits the road. <clears throat> Everybody's talked about this message. You cannot send out a message that is based on hype and snake oil. You've got to do the science, because then I think everybody, the science, the skeptics, everybody, if your science, science is solid, that's what will happen. So uh, that was led with my first study and the second study, and I think I feel that the way you've heard me conclude time and again about cardiovascular disease is that Coronary artery disease is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that need never, ever exist. And if it does exist, it need never, ever progress. This is a completely benign foodborne uh, illness. So I guess my plea to the, uh, to the moderators uh, wish that we could all sort of see what we have for the vision. My vision is that we can actually solidify the, the science and really get that message of science in a format that the public can get their arms around so we can really then move forward. Thank you.